Now we will move to necessity. Section 81 deals with necessity. The section reads as nothing is an offence merely by reason of its being done with the knowledge that is likely to cause harm if it is to be done without any criminal intention to cause harm and in good faith for the purpose of preventing or avoiding other harm to person or property. That is very important. The last part is very important. That last part says about for what purpose we define we excluding a person from criminal liability. To invoke this section, the following ingredients must be necessary. First one is the act must be done under good faith. Second one is there must be no mens rea. And the third one is the act is done in order to avoid greater evil. These three are the essential ingredients in order to invoke section 81. Section 81 is embodied on the principle that where the accused choose lesser evil in order to avoid the bigger, then he is immune. The genesis of the principle emanates from two maxims, could necessitates non habet legum, which means necessity knows no law and the second maxim is necessitates vindict legum, which means necessity overcomes the law. This doctrine of necessity recognizes that the law has to be broken to achieve a greater good. The illustration of the section explains lucidly how the doctrine of necessity works. It is pertinent to know that although section 81 does not specifically refer to greater evil or lesser evil, it in effects deals with the case of lesser evil. Section 80 and 81 are analogous provisions. The former dealing with accidents and the later with inevitable accidents. Section 80 stipulates the absence of criminal intention as well as criminal knowledge, whereas section 81 stipulates the absence of criminal intention alone. There is an intention, but it is not criminal. The intention was to avoid greater evil. That was the intention under section 81. In fact, section 81 clearly contemplates a situation where the accused has knowledge that he is likely to cause harm but is specifically stipulated that such knowledge shall not be held against him. In one case, R versus Dudley and Stephens is a very important case with respect to uh, accident, accident and necessity. Three seamen and a cabin boy were the crew of an English vessel. Due to shipwreck, the three seamen and the boy escaped and were put into open boat. On 20th day, when they had no food for uh, 8 days and no water for 5 days, the accused killed the boy and fed on the flesh and blood 4 days to survive themselves. On the 4th day, they were picked up by a passing vessel and subsequently they were prosecuted for the offence of murder of the boy. The accused pleaded the defence of necessity to get exemption from criminal liability. The question is whether the accused is entitled to get the benefit of necessity. First question is killing a person whether it comes under section 81 or whether it comes under the concept of necessity. The privy council held that the accused guilty of murder, the accused is he is guilty of murder and he is convicted on the following grounds. The ratio which is suggested by the privy council, the first one is the self preservation is not an absolute necessity. So, self preservation is out of the concept of necessity. The second one is no man has a right to take another's life to preserve his own and the last one is there is no necessity that justifies homicide. This is about accident. So, this is the three cardinal principle still relevant when we are discussing about the concept of necessity and accident. These three principles are still relevant, uh, still relevant in adjudicating the principle of what um, necessity. Next, we will move to infancy. 
Section 82 and 83 deals with infancy. Section 82 says, nothing is an offence which is done by a child under 7 years of age. Section 83 says, nothing is an offence which is done by a child above 7 years of age and under 12 who has not attained maturity of understanding to judge of the nature and consequence of his conduct on that occasion. These sections confers immunity from criminal liability on child offenders. The immunity is based on the principle of juvenile justice. The constitutional basis can be derived from article 15 sub clause 3, 39 E and F of the constitution of India. All these provisions mandates that the state can enact a new law, state can enact a special legislation for the protection of children. It is presumed that a child below the age of 7 years is doubly incapacitated. It means that such a child is incapable of doing a criminal act and cannot form the necessary mens rea to commit a crime. This presumption is conclusive. He is incapable to distinguish right and wrong. Section 83 presumes that a child above 7 but below 12 years of age is doubly capax. That means, he is capable to commit a crime depending upon the maturity of understanding. But this presumption is not conclusive. Whereas, section 82 says it is a conclusive, but the causes the act which is explained in section 83 which is not conclusive. With respect to section 82 and 83, the burden is upon the prosecution to prove beyond reasonable doubt that the child caused an actus, actus reus with mens rea and that he knew that his conduct was not merely mischievous but wrong. However, once the court come to a conclusion that the concerned child has not attained sufficient maturity of understanding, then the maturity conferred by section 83 is an absolute as that conferred by section 82. The principle of the principle of innocence is based on the principle of immaturity of intellect. The proof of attainment of sufficient maturity can be derived at by a court on the consideration of all the circumstances of the case. It can be inferred from the nature of the act and his subsequent conduct and other allied factors such as demeanor and the appearance in the court. It need not be proved by the prosecution by positive evidence. Beyond the age of 12, there is no immunity from criminal liability. Even if the offender is a person of undeveloped and incapable of understanding the nature and consequence of his act, all the, ju all the juvenile in conflict with the law is now governed by Juvenile Justice Act 2000. The perusal of the JJ Act makes us clear that it is not giving any punishment for juveniles, but at the same time it is not exonerating the juveniles from criminal liability. But it would appear that something akin to immunity is provided to delinquent juveniles under the Act. One case in Ulla Mahapatra vs. King. A boy 11 and below 12 picked up his knife and advanced towards another. He threatened the others by saying that he would cut him into bits and did actually what he said. It was held that he was having sufficient maturity of understanding because he did what he intended. In another case, in Walter versus Lund, the parent of a child aged 7 years were charged with receiving from their son a child's tricycle knowing it have been stolen by their child. It was held that the parent must be acquitted on the ground that since the child could not steal that tricycle, it will not be considered as a stolen property. So, that is it is a very interesting judgment. A child, in fact, we can say that a child who stolen a particular a thing and the parents accepted by knowing that it is a stolen property. The question of law that is arises whether a child can be a thief 
or he can be prosecuted. Because as I said, a child below the age of 7 years is doubly incapacitated. It is a conclusive proof. This case is the best example which the court come to a conclusion that a child is doubly incapacitated. Since he is doubly incapacitated, he cannot be prosecuted for the offence of the parents cannot be prosecuted for the offence of theft. So, let us conclude. Today in this lecture, we discuss mistake of law, mistake of fact, infancy, accident, necessity. Except mistake of law, all other defences, it is recognised under Indian Penal Code. The one of the essential or one of the features of these offences, not these offences, the end chapter general exceptions, we can say. If suppose when a lawyer is taking the defence of general exceptions, either mistake of fact, necessity, accident or infancy or insanity, whatever, the initial burden is always upon the accused person. And if the accused person is not able to substantiate his case or his defence in a proper way, there is only one conclusion that is conviction. So, whenever a lawyer takes the defence under chapter 4, he must ensure that he, mu he, he must be in a position or he can prove substantiate his case, his defence in a court of law. That is a very important point when we discuss about the concept of general exceptions. And when we discuss about all these concepts, except mistake of law, all these elements lacks mens rea. It is the basic principle behind chapter 4 of the Indian Penal Code. Thank you.